together. Matthew chapter 6, verse 10. Let's read this together. Jesus says, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Let's pray. Father, today I ask you to do beyond what I can do as a communicator. Holy Spirit, we need you because you're the great teacher that speaks to hearts individually. And so we need you to come and just show us the areas in our hearts, Lord God, that have grown dull. Show us areas we need to trust you again. Show us areas where we need to be fresh and vibrant in our relationship with you. And our prayer is that the kingdom of heaven would not only be available to us, but flowing through us to a world that desperately needs a touch of God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Started this series last week, and I'm, I'm so excited about it. And we're going to talk a little bit more, I think, along the same lines, because I really believe that there's something God wants us to really uh, understand as we head into this series. Somebody say more. How many know in these last days we need to see more miracles, more healings, more deliverance, more of the glory of God, more power? more ministries, more churches planted. How many know we need more ministries, more churches? I believe there's people in this service, you have a call of God in your life. Maybe you're watching online. God wants to use you to plant a ministry or a church or whatever the case may be. How many know in these last days, I believe that the greatest revival that the earth has ever seen is something that God has been planning since the creation of man, and we are on the cusp of it. But the question is, do I want to be part of it? And I believe with all of my heart that if we want to be part of this move of God, there is a culture that not only, I believe, attracts the kingdom of heaven, but also helps us to maintain what God wants to do. Jesus said this in Mark 16. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will follow those who believe. Let me stop there a moment and ask you a question. How many believers do I have? How many believe on the Son of, of God, Jesus Christ? Well, this applies to you. Say, this yes. is for me. for me. All right, let's read on. And these signs will follow those who believe, that's you and me. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents. And if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. The truth is, I'm sorry to say, so many churches, so many ministries, we've reduced the kingdom of heaven to a bunch of good thoughts, a bunch of self-help clubs. Come on. How many know we need to direct our thoughts? How many know you need help once in a while? Can we be honest? I'm not the only one in the room that needs a little bit of help in my mind. You do too. But that is not what the gospel is. The gospel is about signs and wonders, and you can't separate the two. God wants to do signs, wants to do wonders, wants us to give our hearts to, to, to him so we can live with him for all of eternity. And the truth is, Jesus never meant for miracles to just be an end in of themselves, but in fact, it was a way to invite people into the kingdom of heaven. You see it all through the book of Acts, and it's really our model for the church today. Now, last week, I spent a great deal of time looking at a story in Luke chapter 15. Many of us know the story. You can read it on your own. I'm not going to turn there this morning. But it's a story, really, of, of two sons. And so many of us just know it as the prodigal son, and we've been introduced to it. It's certainly a picture of someone coming back to Christ. I get that. But I think there's so much more going on in this parable. It's really about a father who is good and gracious, but it's about two sons that are in the house that don't realize all that is available to them. And I believe it speaks volumes to the church today. And the reality of it is every one of us is like one of those two sons at some point in our life. And a lot of times we're like both of them at the same time. I mean, no, you know, we can be. And the thing is, the younger son, we know him because he's the one that says, give me my inheritance. And I think of that, I think of that attitude, give me my inheritance. He goes to the father and says, I want it now, I don't want to wait. And how many ever heard of something called sibling rivalry? You know, you have any brothers or sisters or maybe someone you're really close to and you're kind of competitive with? He's like, I'm sick of waiting. And I see that, that both of these boys are, are, are very similar in a lot of ways. They think that they can earn their inheritance through servantship. You say, what are you saying, Pastor Tony? Well, the younger son that I just mentioned, he says, give me my inheritance. Well, his father gives it to him, and then he wastes it. And the Bible says he was eaten in the pig's trough. Come on, somebody. That's not a good place to be, but it's a good place for a revelation, right? And the Bible says he comes back, and he says to his father, make me as one of your servants. That's interesting. 
He thought that the way back home was as a servant. Now, I realize he was humbling himself, but we have to look at what's going on here. The older son, he doesn't even come to the party because his father, he's, he picks up that younger son. He says, get up off your feet. He says, I'm going to put a robe on your back. I'm going to put a ring on your finger. I'm going to put sandals on your feet. You're my son. And he throws a party, and the older son's like, I ain't going. He doesn't go, and he's angry, and he says to his father, that's what he says, you read the story on your own. He says, I'm not going to rejoice. He says, this son of yours, doesn't even call him his brother. He came back home, and you slay the fatted calf. He said, I've been here all these years. He says, I have served you faithfully, and I have done all that you've commanded. See, both of those sons, they had this attitude. They thought their inheritance came through serving, through keeping the commandments. And I think it paralyzes the church so many times. We don't want to wait on God, and, and, and we think, you know, I've waited long enough. I've got this call of God on my life, or God's called me to start a, a business, or God's called me into the business world, or whatever it may be, and we don't want to wait on God, and we say, I want it now. And, oh, we may get a little bit of blessing with it for a short time. How many know the story of Jacob and Esau? Jacob got some blessings, but how many know his heart was still wrong? And so many times we'd be able to just give that, and we don't want to wait on God's perfect timing. Or we can be like the older son. We've forgotten how to celebrate. We've forgotten how to rejoice. We've lost sight of our inheritance. We replace sonship with servantship and sacrifice. There's nothing wrong with sacrifice and serving. How many know those are good attributes? Jesus taught us to be that way. But that's not the way we gain our inheritance or keep our inheritance, say, in the house. See, I love it. Psalm 92, 13, it says, those who are planted in the house of the Lord are going to bear fruit, even in old age. And somebody, come on, help me out, say amen. amen. All right, if you're over 40, you can claim that. Am I saying you're older 40? Heck no. What do they say? They say 60 is the new 30. I believe it. I want to be 61 in a couple months, and it is the new 30 <laughs> times two. All right. But so many times we, 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 we've forgotten about the blessings of God and how we didn't have to work to get into the kingdom. And the truth is you and I are in the house, but the Bible says that if we're planted, then we will bear fruit. And we're not planted. I see in the body of Christ we just bounce from here to there and, and relationships, and when we don't get what we want or whatever, you know the story. It happens so many times. But God wants us to build deep relationships because the kingdom of God is about family. Come on, somebody. Now, next Sunday, we've got Josh McDonald here. Somebody thought I said Josh McDowell last service, and they know him personally. I'm like, you got to get him here to preach for us, all right? I mean, Josh McDowell might have something to say. No, it's Josh McDonald. He didn't have a farm, no, but... But you know he comes, and, and he's part of Luke 18 Project. Some of you have his T-shirts that says, Revival is family. Somebody say family. And I believe the culture in the kingdom of heaven, it's become so corporate-like, so business-like, so competitive. We get in this pecking order, and we think, well, you know, just this, this, and that, and then I have the blessings of God. And I think so many times, if we're ambitious, people walk out, and because they're ambitious, they may have some success for a while, but we don't understand the kingdom mentality and its family. We're in the house. We're sons. We're daughters. We've got to put an end to old religious paradigms that are hindering us and the kingdom of God from coming because the truth is in many churches, the kingdom of God is not there. And we believe God is moving in our midst. We love what God is doing in relationships and services and small groups in our lives. And we believe God is just getting started. And we see so many things happening as a ministry, but I wanted to really preach a message that would show us what God's trying to do so that we can fight for it and understand that there are things that we need to do in order to keep it. How many know if you want to have a strong family for years and grandchildren and great-grandchildren, you got to fight for that. Come on, somebody know what I'm talking about. So many times offenses come right in our own homes, right in our own families, and people will say, well, I'm not even your son anymore. I'm not even your daughter anymore. Or they may say, I'm ashamed to you. I wish you weren't my son or my daughter. And how many know that can hurt? But if you want to have a healthy family for generations, it's something that takes work. It's no different in a church body because family is revival. 1 Corinthians 4, it says, For though you might have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I have begotten you through the gospel. 
There's all kinds of instructors out there. There's all kinds of great stuff. In fact, I see you all posting stuff on Facebook. Get a little snippet here and a little snippet here. How many know that's good? But so many times the books that we read and, and the things that we watch that encourage us and the videos, and those are all great things, okay? But understand, they can't replace relationship. I love multimedia. I love what, what's going on on the Internet. I love the way that the people of God are using that. But understand something. That can never replace relationships. You can have 1,200 followers on Facebook. You can have 800 followers on Twitter pack or whatever it is. You can have 350 followers on whatever the newest one is. I don't even know all the names. But you can have no one at your funeral if you pass away because those people don't know you. I understand some of them do. Don't misunderstand me. But we're in an age where we think that can replace relationships, and it can't. It's about families. Remember, Jesus taught us to pray our Father who is in heaven. He didn't say pray our God who is in heaven. It's our Father. God is our Father. Jesus is his son. Jesus is our older brother. Get a hold of this. We need to. The Bible calls us the bride of Christ. To mirror heaven, I believe the church must be built on family values and relational connections. And we see that happening in our midst. And, and I believe that God wants us to fight for it and something that can continue to grow from generation to generation. I believe kingdom-minded churches need to create a culture in which there's covenantal family relationships. Covenant. What does that mean? It can't be broken. That doesn't mean God can't move people into a different city or, or around the world or whatever. How many know the gospel needs to be preached? But it's about covenant. Is there loyalty? Is there honor? Is there, are there things? And we're seeing this happen. But listen, unless we understand what God wants to do, it's kind of hard to perpetuate it. Does this make sense to you? And so God wants us to realize that he's building a family. We're attached through fathers and mothers and family. It's not about doctrine. And understand, doctrine is important, and we're not going to waver on the important doctrine. We'll teach that. But whether we agree or disagree on everything, doctrine-wise, is not what it's about. We need to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that we're born again by believing on him, and now we're welcome in the family. And those other things we can sort through. But the bottom line is, am I dedicated to the family that God has planted me in? And the truth is, when we live life this way, we have more revelation of the Scriptures. Our relationships are richer Revelation has always come through relationship, not intense study. It's not about reading the Bible more. It's not about packing down more chapters. How many know it's good to read your Bible? I hope you believe that because we believe in this book. This is a love story right here that God wrote about his bride and preparing her to marry his son. We need to know what it says. These are the promises a couple of weeks ago. What a great message we had on marriage and and the body of Christ, and how we're the bride of Christ. These are promises of what he has planned for us, his family. In John 5, Jesus said, You search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. And these are they which testify of me, but you're not willing to come to me, that you may have life. It's not just about studying the word. It's about relationships. The people of God's, of Jesus' time, the religious people of his time, didn't even recognize him, and they knew the scriptures better than anybody. The goal of the Bible has always been to bring us into an encounter and a relationship with God, not just to memorize books, not just to memorize words. Nothing wrong with that, because how else are you going to take your thoughts captive? But that's not what it's about. We're like that older son. Well, I've memorized this, and I've memorized that, and I've paid my tithes, and I did my time in children's church. Come on, somebody. I played on the worship team long enough. There's no room for that in the kingdom. Say kingdom. Say family. Say revival. This is the culture of heaven. John 17, Jesus said, and this is eternal life. What? That you may know God the only true one, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. See, revelation and, and eternal life is about knowing God, about knowing Jesus and having relationship with one another. And then through that relationship, the glory of God is released and other people's lives are blessed and changed and transformed through our lives. 
Chris Vallotton, some of you may know him, author, pastor, prophet, just a blessing to the, the body of Christ, uh, part of the um, Bethel group out there. And, and he said this, I, I want you to listen. He said, someone might argue that if you base your relationship with God on an experience, you could be deceived. That is true. But on the other hand, if you study the Bible and it does not lead you into an encounter with the Almighty, then you are already deceived. Think about that. God wants to have an encounter with us. The question is, do I want an encounter with him? Am I willing, somebody say more. Am I willing to lay everything down and say, God, I'm dedicated to doing everything you asked me to do, surrendering to your will, knowing that everything is available to me, not by my achievements, not by my efforts, but you want to move through me. So I surrender everything so that you can bless people's lives through my life. See, the moment we abandon a relationship with God and make it our mission to understand the Bible, we are on the road to deception. 2 Timothy 3, it says, having a form of godliness, but denying its power. There's people who are saying all over the place, well, you know, signs and wonders and miracles. Those aren't for today. People who, who preach that, they're just way out there. They're in the wrong place. Listen, that doesn't even make any sense if you think about it. Why would God bless the beginning of something better than the end? In fact, there's a proverb that says the end of something is always better than the start of something. Come on, somebody say amen. The Bible says that he's the author and the finisher of our faith. My goodness, if everything that he could do through us was only something that started 2,000 years ago, how could he finish it without signs and wonders and miracles and glory and the power of God flowing through his church? Somebody say revival. Having a form of godliness, I've heard, I've heard people take this very scripture here that I'm citing, 2 Timothy 3, 5, and say, well, you know, that's just about getting saved. That's about the power of salvation. Well, absolutely. But why is it we think we can separate the power? How many know that's the greatest miracle of all was when God saved somebody's soul? But you can't separate that miracle from other signs and wonders. It was all one package when Jesus came. He says, this is the kingdom of heaven. This is what it looks like. And if you take a look at his prayer in John chapter 17, he says, the same glory that you gave me, I give to them and everyone who believes by their testimony. It doesn't change 2,000 years later. And, and I've got to tell you, I'm tired of, of preachers and pastors and ministries saying, well, you know, it's just we got to study this and we got to get this doctrine right and we got to get that doctrine right. Listen, there's some basic doctrines, like I said, we won't waver on. Jesus Christ is the only way, the only truth, the only life. There is no other way to God but him. But there are things that we have left out. There's so many churches just say, well, you know, it's not for today. But listen to what it says here in verse 7. Always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. So you can't separate them. It's not just always about learning and, and getting more in my head and being able to philosophize better than everybody else. It's about relationships. I tell you, I think some of, some of the coldest, meanest, lifeless people that I've ever met are people that have got this thing all figured out. Man, if you figure this out, you're in trouble. <laughs> Come on, you think about it. Well, I figured out the Bible. Now on to something better. You can't figure that out. And I thank God for teachers and, and preachers and pastors and, and all the things we have available. But understand something. It's about a relationship. And you give up the relationship with God when you deny that he's working in powers and miracles and signs and wonders. You, you just forget about it. There is no relationship in that. It doesn't exist. I want to read something. Author, speaker, evangelist Randy Clark. Some of you may know his name. A very instrumental. God used him in the revival that so many of us were aware of at the Toronto airport. Man, it's got to be uh, close to 20 years ago now, whatever it was. And God's still using him. Some great things still coming out of that area of the world and others that are uh, really offshoots of that and plantings from that. But he says this. It's a little lengthy, but I want to read it, and I believe it to be so true. In the days of Jesus and the first disciples, the power of for signs, wonders, healings, miracles, and deliverance was not just to authenticate the message. This power was the expression of the message. Think about that. When you read through the, the Gospels, when you read the book of Acts, it's all just one thing. It's one package. It's, it's not just an expression of the message. 
but it's the power of the message. And he says, signs and wonders were not performed to validate the good news. They were a vital element of the good news. Signs and wonders and miracles are not to validate it. That's part of it. You can't throw the baby out with the bathwater. You know what I'm saying. They were a vital element of the good news. To put it another way, miracles do not primarily prove doctrine about God. So much as they reveal the nature of God, God has not changed, neither is the gospel message. God moves in power, in signs and wonders, healing the sick, in deliverances, multiplying food for the hungry, raising the dead, primarily for this reason. He is good. And it is his desire to reveal his goodness, his glory in all the earth. I mean, come on, get a hold of that. And so when we separate it all and, you know, when we just turn church into, a, into some kind of country club or some kind of place to hang out and study and become smarter in all of our smartness, and we deny the power of God that's able to change people's lives, able to heal people. Come on, somebody. We got to believe in this. The world needs to see this in a greater abundance than we see right now. What's the purpose to memorize the whole Bible yet never come into a relationship with the one who wrote it? Come on, somebody. It doesn't make any sense. It's silly. I read all about you on Facebook, so I know you. Think about that. No, you don't. You don't know. You, put the, you see the stuff I put on there, the stuff I let you know about me. Come on. You don't know someone until you get close and you get in the nitty, the gritty, the good, the bad, and the ugly. I've said it before, but I think it's so funny. You know, Trish, she made a list before she met me of all the things she wanted in a husband and all the things she didn't want. I love that list that Sandy, she got, I mean, boy, God bless her with Nigel, and she got almost all the things she asked for. Well, Trish got the good, the bad, and the ugly. She got the whole list. (laughs) But see, she saw, my, she saw God's potential in me. But the thing is, there's nobody that knows me like she knows me. Nobody in this world. My kids know me, and the older they get, and the more time they spend with me, the more they get to know more about me. But they'll never know me like she knows me. And it's not because I study everything she writes. I study her presence. Who she is. She studies who I am, how I think. How I react. It's not just about memorizing. It's seeing, well, God is good. All through this book, you can see how good God is. And people will say, well, the Old Testament God was a mean God, and the New Testament God is a loving God, and there's so many inconsistencies. Listen, you got to understand something. First of all, you don't understand this whole book. Secondly, it's the same God, and there were things in the Old Testament going on because the Holy Spirit wasn't released yet. And God was protecting his seed so the Holy Spirit could come. And I don't have time to to, to break it all down for you this morning, but it's the same God. It's the same good God, and he's always been trying to save and preserve his bride, and that's you and me. All through that book. You can't deny it. That's a good place to shout. He deserves it. (laughs) Say Revelation. John 15, Jesus said, I no longer call you servants. Remember our two sons? They thought the way to the inheritance was serving. Jesus said, I don't call you servants, for a servant doesn't know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends for all things that I have heard from my Father, I have made known to you. Revelation comes through friendship, through relationship, through sonship. Friendship with God unlocks his secrets, his treasures. Deuteronomy 29, the secret things belong to the Lord our God. But those things which are revealed belong to us and to our children forever that we may do all the words of this law. Do you see the word of God is not something just for us, but it's something for our children and our children's 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 children. It's about family. Say family is revival. Romans 8. Many of us know this, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons and daughters of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba. Let me just tell you this. When we don't create a culture of family, and it's all about study, and it's all about achievements and those kinds of things, you know that that kind of environment breeds fear? We think we're not good enough. Because we, we see everybody's good side and all their achievements, and we think, I don't measure up. 
But the Bible says here, we don't have the spirit of fear, but we have what? The spirit of adoption, whom we cry out, Abba, Father. What does that Abba mean? It means daddy. I heard somebody say it means papa, papa, whatever. You think of a term of endearment. It means something close. My children call me papa. Something kind of passed down from my parents. And Trish said, that's okay, we'll do that. I and mean, there's nothing wrong with mom. There's nothing wrong with dad. There's nothing wrong with father, I guess. I mean, most people don't say, yes, father. Yes, mother. I mean, most of us have, think about it, most of us have these, these little, these, these names that we have for our parents as daddy. You know, when we're talking to someone, like Jesus even said, my father in heaven, we may say, well, my father does this. But when we get in relationship, it's, hey, Papa, what's up? Hey, daddy, can you help me out? Is this making sense to you? And see, unless we create that culture, not just with our heavenly father, but it's a culture that permeates the whole body, then it's hard for us to perpetuate what it is that God wants to do through our lives in this area of revival. It says the spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we're children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. Now, next week, I already said Josh is here. But the week after, I'm going to talk a little bit about the glory of God. You've got to understand something. The glory of God is something that's very powerful. It manifests in a whole lot of different ways. But it literally means the weighty presence of God. And that's why we worship for 45 minutes, I mean, half hour, usually first service, because we got to make room, but sometimes I don't even get a chance to preach first service, but I don't need to. When God moves like that, we understand worship. Some, some people say, well, why do you worship so long? And, we're, and, 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 we, and listen, we understand some people that may not be what they're looking for, but you know what? It's because we, I believe that we've kind of just thrown it out and said, well, we're doing these three songs and it's going to take 15 minutes. And if the worship leader doesn't, if he takes more than 15 minutes, he may not have his job next year. <laughs> say, pastor, oh, that's how it is. I, I'm, I, if you will, I, I'm, I've been in the industry for a few years too, and that is how it is. It is how it is. I remember worship leader, and I, I, loved, I loved Jesus, great church, but I remember we had a list, and every one of my songs, I had to have a time on it, and I'd sit down and say, okay, this one's three minutes, this is four minutes, this is six minutes, there's 15 minutes, good, that's all you get. Boom, boom, boom. Was God in it? Sure. <laughs> we were worshiping. Did the glory of God manifest the way it could have? I, I don't believe so. Say, well, God will use teaching and preach. Absolutely. But understand, if you don't have the presence of God, you've got nothing but a bunch of words, and I can stand up here and try and convince you all day long, but if God's presence isn't in this place to convict, to challenge, to love, to remove fear, to start to help you on the inside, which we have this morning, and that comes through waiting in his presence. And we love it. You can sit down, and some of you do. That's Okay. Sometimes all you can do is sit down. Sometimes all you can do is suck the rug. Sometimes all you can do is lay down. It's okay. But the glory of God changes people. Again, we'll, we'll take a look at that more in the, in the weeks to come. But The truth is, the Bible says we're adopted and now we're heirs with Christ. Revelation 3.21, it says that we are enthroned with him. With him. Now, please, I don't want you to hear something I don't say. I want you to hear what I'm saying. All right? We are not equal with Christ. We are not Christ. We are not God. But we inherit the same blessings. Again, I go back to John 17. Jesus said, the very glory and the things that my Father has spoken and done for me, the Holy Spirit will now interpret and speak to you, and I give them to you as if you were me. That's my paraphrase. But you start to meditate on that. Jesus is saying we are equal in what we get as our inheritance. Okay? We can never be God. We can never be Jesus. And that's not what I'm saying. But if God did it for Jesus in his earthly ministry, he's doing it for us. And that's why the Holy Spirit came. We're no longer slaves. We're adopted as sons. God is our daddy. Our position is not determined by our personal achievements, seminaries, or degrees. And the reason I really think God wants us to get this as we start this message is to continue to nurture what we're seeing God do in our midst we need to realize that it's not about getting more study. Now, listen, education's good. Study is good. Degrees, there's, no, there's nothing wrong with that. 
But see, here's what we think so many times. Well, I did this, this, that, went to Bible school. If, if, if I'm called to ministry, let's say, did this, check, 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 check. And now it's time for my promotion. Now we're like the younger son is saying, I want it now. Listen, we need to understand something, that God is still doing something. And you're going to see in a few minutes that there's something that, 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 that the Bible talks about that I'll call a mantle. In fact, it's mentioned that way. And it's really a mantle that is given, a special anointing that is given to a leader to fulfill their mission. And the only way it's transferred is by the laying on of hands. And I won't have time to look at a lot of it. I'm going to look at a couple examples this morning. But this is why it's important. So many times I've seen people, they say, well, you know, I think I want to be a pastor when I grow up. And so they go to Bible school, and then they come out, and they go to a church, and they get a job, and then they find out, this isn't what I thought it was going to be. And this happens, okay? It happens. But when it comes to covenantal relationships where we say, you know what, we're in covenant together. The kingdom of God is here and moving like we're seeing. Now I'm going to prepare. I'm going to do everything I can from the call of God in my life, whether it's in business, whether it's in ministry, whatever it is. But then I want the blessing of the father of the house that comes through the pastors and the elders, the older brothers, the older sisters. Is anybody with me? And it comes for this transfer. And that is what transfers the anointing and the power of God. I mean, just because your sign outside your church says Christ church doesn't mean he's there. Come on. It's the truth. And it, it only comes through this. It only comes through relationship and a transference of the mantle of God, if you will. Our authority is not based on what we know, but rather whom we know. Galatians 1 Paul said, but when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through his grace to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately confer with flesh and blood. I want to stop there for a minute. I was reading this the other day, and I thought, you know, do you remember when, when, when Peter had the revelation of who Jesus was? He said, you're the son of God. And Jesus said, yeah. He said, flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father in heaven. It comes through relationship. And Jesus knocked Paul down, gave him a call. And I've seen people use this scripture and say, well, you know, who is the body of Christ? And why do we need to submit to this pastor or that pastor and say, well, you know what, we're just going to go do our own thing. I've seen people come to this very ministry, and if I wouldn't lay hands on them and make them a pastor as quick as they wanted to, they were gone. And before I knew it, they had an ordination in the mail. Woo, you don't want someone like that being your pastor. You want someone that had hands laid on them. You want someone that has authority, that has the mantle of God, and it only comes this way. Yeah. We'll say, well, pastor, you're just, you're just promoting yourself. No, that didn't, no, believe me, I, I'm nothing without the mantle of God. I'm nothing without the anointing to fulfill the mission that God's called me to do and to lead a group of people into that same mission. <laughs> say, well, pastor, I, I don't hear this preached. Well, it should be preached a lot more because we don't understand it. Because our churches, we're, we're too busy just learning this doctrine and that doctrine and this study and that Bible study. You know, the wrong Bible studies. I can't say that enough. But it's about the power and the presence of God. And he says, I immediately did not curve with flesh and blood, nor did I go to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went to Arabia, returned again to Damascus. Now, he didn't confer with flesh and blood. This isn't saying he never went to Jerusalem. He went to Jerusalem several times. Matter of fact, the first time he went, they were afraid that he was coming to kill them. Because if you read the story in the book of Acts, he was persecuting Christians. His name was Saul, not Paul. And they're like, we don't want him coming here. He's going to kill us. But he came. He said, this is what God's been doing in me. If you take a look at, at the book of Galatians, it says he took three years and he, and he was seeking God. And he was finding out about the call. And then he talked to them in Jerusalem. And they said, no, we see it. 14 years later, the Bible says, now I don't believe that's the only time he ever went back there. But it says he went back again. And this time he came with Barnabas and he came with Titus. You read it yourself. Don't just take my word for it, but it's the truth. And he said, well, we don't know what to do because we got all these Judaizers. He didn't call them that, but that's what they were. They were saying, well, it's Jesus and circumcision. They were coming everywhere he'd go. They'd say, well, it's not enough. You've got to be circumcised. So they were wanting to circumcise people and, and all this stuff. And Paul said, what should I do? He was submitted to someone else. And they said, well, you know what? Just don't, don't eat things offered to idols and take care of the poor and preach the gospel. <laughs> that's the only doctrine you really need. If you got the power, if you got the authority, if you got the presence of God, all that other stuff will work itself out. I'm not kidding you. Again, we can't fudge on the gospel and, and how it comes through Jesus Christ. And I'm not, I'm not saying we ever will. But we throw so many of these things out in our churches. When God calls a person to lead, he releases his favor on them. 
There's a story in the Bible, and it talks about a man named Joshua. You may know him. God called Moses. I'm going to have the worship team come up, as a matter of fact, if you can. Well, I know you can, if you will, I should say. You know Moses, he was the one that led the children of Israel out of Egypt and their bondage and for 40 years. Well, in fact, the word of the Lord was, hey, I want you, he says to Pharaoh, God said, let my people go so that they can come out in the wilderness to worship me. God wanted a relationship with them. They didn't want that. They said, well, Moses can talk to you and then he can come give us your instructions and we'll do it. 40 years. Joshua was the one who took the children of Israel, Israel into the promised land, but God was preparing him under Moses' leadership. All right? And Deuteronomy 34, it says, Now Joshua, the son of Nun, was full of the spirit of wisdom, for Moses had laid his hands on him. Do you see that? It's the laying on of hands. It comes, you know, somebody, somebody says, you know, Pastor, and I've, we've had this happen in this church. Say, hey, Pastor, you know, I've been believing God to start a business. They say, what do you think about this, that, and the other thing? And I say, boy, it sounds good, and we'll pray, and we, lay, we believe laying on of hands, and we pray. And they say, you know, I'm feeling good about it. I'll start the business. We have people come and say, we're supposed to be missionaries here. We're supposed to be missionaries there. Well, we're going to lay hands on you. We're going to plant a church here and there. We're going to lay hands on you. It's going to come through relationship. Numbers 27, it says, And the Lord said to Moses, Take Joshua, the son of Nun, with you, a man in whom is the Spirit, and lay your hand on him. Set him before Eleazar the priest, and before all the congregation, inaugurate him in their sight. And you shall give some of your authority to him, that all the congregation of the children of Israel may be obedient. Some of your authority to him. And the authority all comes from God. You realize, the Bible says all authority comes from God. And you say, well, this is Old Testament. No, in the New Testament, you see the same thing. We don't have time today. Oh, my goodness. Will you give me five minutes? Can you give me five extra minutes? Is that okay? Would you? Would you do that? Okay. They, say, they don't care. They keep worshiping when I leave up here. So they don't, they don't, they don't count. No, they count. But listen, because you see in the New Testament the very same thing. Where the apostles laid hands on Paul, they laid hands on Barabbas, uh, Barnabas rather, so that he that they could be sent into the ministry. They, they knew God called them, but they needed the hands laid on them, and that's where Paul's ministry explodes. He's preaching the gospel before that, but his ministry explodes, literally. And it comes through the transference of a mantle, of an anointing, if you will. Again, we're all gifted. We're all called. But something comes through relationship. Something comes through honor and respect and a spiritual covering. Listen, so many times we don't understand this in our churches. We don't get this anymore. But it says, bring him. He says, take some of your authority and lay it on him. When God commissions a leader, he releases mantles over them. It gives them supernatural abilities to complete their mission. Listen, I believe so many pastors, they say the, the failure rate for pastors is ridiculous. Most pastors, I'm just talking about ministry. Most pastors will not even retire, if you will, from the pastorate. And a lot of it, I think, is for this very reason. They get discouraged. There's a lot of different things that can happen. But when there, when there is, and you know, and that's why we belong to Link, and that's why we're part of, of Radiant Network and those things. So we have people over us who encourage us, who pray over us, who give us ideas and things from the Lord and, and keep us accountable. And then we try, I mean, this is how the kingdom of heaven works. Oh, my goodness. If we support and honor our leaders, we inherit their victories. And you see this in the Old Testament. I'm not going to turn there right now, but you can find it in Exodus chapter 17. It says that Joshua was anointed to be the leader of the armies of God. He was the one that would take them into the promised land. But here they are in the wilderness. Moses is still alive, and he's going to go out to battle. And they found out that the only time that Joshua was victorious is when Moses had his hands lifted up with the rod of God, the same rod that parted the seas. And so they found out, yeah, when his, he gets tired, his arms go down, Joshua doesn't win. And so Aaron and her, two other leaders who understood this, came and lifted his hands up. And as long as Moses, his hands were lifted, they sat him on a rock, they put his arms up and held him. Joshua was victorious. 
There's a story in the book of Acts. I, again, I don't have time to turn there. You can look to it yourself in chapter 19. It says that God worked unusual miracles through Paul. Again, this is after he's been sent out, hands laid on him by the Jerusalem Council, the early church. He worked unusual mar and, and And there was these seven sons of Sceva. That's, that's what it is, seven, seven sons of Sceva. All right, a Jewish exorcist. And the Bible says that the anointing on Paul, listen, you got to get this, the anointing on Paul was so strong that even handkerchiefs healed people. Even his shadow. All the, there's, all, there's things, the anointing was so strong on him. But the seven sons of Sceva, they tried to cast out demons in Jesus' name. And the Bible says the devils got on them, took their clothes off, and threw them out in the street. You read it, that's what happened. Because of the transfer of anointing, because of family, somebody say family, because of the kingdom of heaven, and the way God works, Paul's handkerchief had more authority and power in it than seven sons of Sceva. So you see it in the Old Testament, you see it in the New Testament, but here's the reason, because we fall into one of two categories, or both, of those sons that we started with. We're in the house, but we don't realize we're in the house. We don't understand family, we don't understand covenant. We want everything when we want it, and we want it now or because we think we've served long enough and nobody's recognized us. Now, I, you know, even if you're in the business world, listen, don't go start a business just because you think you want to have one and you're tired of working for somebody. <laughs> if you're tired of working for somebody and that, you think that's a good reason to start a business, you will never succeed the way God wants you to. You need to be the best employee where you are. I mean, that, that's just how it works. So I'm talking about ministry, I'm talking about jobs, and really, I think we have to be concerned about ministry because we're all called to ministry. It all works this way, laying on of hands, transference. We need to realize that so many times we're like that younger son. We want our inheritance now, but we're like the older son. In fact, there's another story. I don't have time today to get to it, but you can read it in Acts chapter 8. The Bible says there's a sorcerer. His name was Simon. And the Bible said that, that he worked wonders so much so that they called him the power of God. It's with a capital G. It's the same word that's used for Jehovah. They thought he was the power of God. That's how many miracles this guy worked. Well, the, the, the Holy Spirit falls, and he sees people getting the gifts of the Spirit, and he goes to the apostles and says, Hey, I want to buy that. And they rebuke him. They say, your money perish with you. Why? Because he's been hard. They said, you were hardened with deceit and bitterness. And what happens so much of the time, we think, well, I earned it. We become deceitful. We become bitter. We become unthankful. We lose our patience. And we miss our inheritance. I mean, it, and it's so many times because we fall into those two categories. So what I want to do, we're going to, we're going to sing one more song. And at least, at least stay and sing part of this with us. I know, I know we're busy and all that, and we have a lot going on. But I believe God wants us to realize that we are family. We are the family of God. And he wants us to just humble ourselves and realize what he's done for us and stop trying to outperform and get in some kind of weird pecking order. And, and those, this, this is how we not only obtain but maintain the presence of God in our services, in our lives, in our small groups, in our ministries, in our outreaches, everything that we do. So I want to sing this together. We have our, our Freedom Lane is open. If you need prayer, come forward. We have prayer people here. Uh, just come forward and just... Lay out before God, kneel before God, worship. If you need to go, we understand that, but don't be in a hurry if you don't have to get somewhere. This time together, worshiping God, singing songs, it's so important. As we declare what we believe in unity, God starts to move in a powerful way. We're so glad you stopped by the website today. We pray the teaching you just listened to impacts you in a way that helps you on your spiritual journey. Please take time to check out the rest of the website. It is full of information about our church, as well as resources to help you in your walk with Christ. If you have not already attended one of our worship services, we hope you make time to visit us in the near future. Everything we do here is designed with you in mind. The Bible says your real life is found in a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. 
All of our activities point to one thing, our mission statement. Real people living real life with a real God who has the answers.